If you've got your Bible, you can open it to Matthew 13 if you want. I'm going to speak today on, on the parable of the sower, which many people will be familiar with, and I've spoken on it before, but I, I thought God wanted me to speak on it today again. I'm going to read from the Message Bible. And it says in Matthew 13, verse 3, it says, What do you make of this? A farmer planted seed... As he scattered the seed, some of it fell on the road and the birds ate it. Some fell in the gravel and sprouted quickly but didn't put down roots. So when the sun, sun came up with it just as quickly, some fell in the weeds as it came up it was strangled by the weeds. Some fell on the good earth and produced a harvest beyond his wildest dreams. Are you listening to this? Really listening. That's Jesus speaking. And then he explains... To the disciples, the disciples come and, you know, first of all they question, well, why are you speaking in parables and, and stories? And then he goes and they want to know what, what he's talking about. What, did, what are you talking about, seed? So, jumping into verse 18, he tells them, he says, Study this story of the farmer planting seed. When anyone hears news of the kingdom and doesn't take it in, it just remains on the surface. And so the evil one comes along and plucks it right out of that person's heart. This is the seed that the farmer scatters on the road. The seed cast in the gravel. This is a person who hears and instantly responds to the, with enthusiasm. But there is no soil or character, and so when the emotions wear off and some difficulty arrives, there is nothing to show for it. The seed cast in the weeds is a person who hears the kingdom news, but the weeds of worry and illusions about getting more and wanting everything under the sun strangle what was heard and nothing comes of it. The seed cast on the, on the good earth is a person who hears and takes in the news and then produces a harvest beyond his wildest dreams. So it talks about four types of seed sowing. On the, on the road, on the gravel, among the weeds and on the good ground. But I want to talk about one more group of seed that doesn't get covered in that parable. And it's the seed that remains in the hand. Seed that is not sown. And there can be reasons why some people hold on to their seed and don't sow it. And I want to look at some of those reasons why. And the first one is fear. You know, God gives us faith. And we get all fired up in faith and then this little thing called fear comes along and spooks us. And sometimes we don't sow because we're afraid that the seed may not grow. And we think, well, I'm afraid to, to plant it because what happens if nothing happens? Sometimes we have fear that because we're We've sown in the past and we've been hurt and disappointed because maybe we sowed and the seed didn't work. And so that, that fear comes in our mind that I, I shared, with, shared in the past and I had a bad experience because this person got angry at me so I'm, I'm too scared to share again. And this spirit of fear comes in. Some of we have that fear because others are sowing and we're afraid that will look pretty bad sowing our crop, you know, compared to theirs. You know, we think, well, ours, mine, mine won't be good enough, so I won't sow, so I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. When I lived in Newborough, my next door neighbour, his lawn was immaculate, and I mean immaculate. It was like a bowling green. Front, back, and the nature strip. The guy mowed it by hand. He had one of those old push mowers. And he would mow it several times a day. <laughs> and then, it gets worse, it gets worse, he would lay down on the ground, so eye level, and he would trim with scissors any bit that got missed. Now the first time 
we come home from somewhere, we've only been in the house for not very long, I drove into the driveway, had Alan in the car, and he was lying on the nature strip. I thought he was dead. <laughs> and I said, to Elaine, I parked the car, I walked down the driveway, because I think this guy's dead on the nature strip, but no, he was laying down. I'm not a great gardener. My mum is an awesome gardener. I'm hopeless. I'm not very good at growing stuff. I don't like getting in the garden weeding, or anything like that. I would mow my lawn every now and but I felt a little bit embarrassed living with this guy who had an immaculate lawn. And, and not only his lawn, his garden was weedless, perfect, and his trees were like a spurt level. They were beautiful. Um, but sometimes we get fear in our life because we compare ourselves. Now the person lived over the back of him come and see me one day and said, do you worry about this guy's lawn? I said, well, no, why? And he said, they, they lived over the back. They were worried because they, they were comparing themselves. They had a spirit of fear because they were trying to compete. And we can be the same. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and a love and of a sound mind. You know, the enemy wants us to be fi fi have fear in our life, you know, and, and the enemy will attack us and say, well, it's a waste of time sowing that seed because it's not going to work. Or it, it's a waste of time because nobody's interested in what you've got to say. Or why sow it? It's not going to grow. Or the weeds are going to get it. Robert Kennedy, who was a senator back in the 60s, said this. He said, Only those who dare to fail greatly can ever achieve greatly. John Dewey, an education reformer, said, Failure is instructive. The person who thinks learns quite as much from his failures as from his successes. So we have to be prepared to fail in our planting. Sometimes we will have successful crops. Sometimes we won't. It's like in the natural as well as spiritual. Sometimes in the natural you, you, you can sow seed and only some of the seed will come up and, and sprout. Not everything you plant will grow, but we just need to be willing to try. And if we fail, we learn from it, we get up and we try again. You know, I spoke on Friday night to the youth group here. And one of the things I shared with them was that they've got to be prepared for the difficult times that come in life. You know, life is not an easy thing. You're going to have difficult times in life. Even if you're doing the right things, you're going to, we live in a fallen world. But the key is to learn from those difficult times. And it's usually when you're in those difficult times that you grow as a person. You learn from your disappointments. The most successful people have all failed at one time or another. What has made them successful is their willingness to get up and have a go. One of my favourite guys in the Bible is Joshua. Uh, he was the guy that led the Israelites into the Promised Land. but he had to be encouraged so many times to be strong and courageous. Now, it's a number of times in scripture he's told by God, be strong and courageous. Why do you have to be told so many times to be strong and courageous? Because he had fear in his life. You know? He'd seen the great, probably the greatest leader ever, Moses, fail. Moses has led the Israelites around and around in the wilderness and they failed to go into the promised land. So he'd seen, seen Moses fail. And he would have, thoughts probably would have gone on his head, well, if Moses couldn't do it, I'm not going to be able to do it either. And he would have that fear. He would have been comparing himself to other people. Out of failure can grow success. Peter was a classic failure. He's my favourite guy in the Bible. As I, I can identify with him, you know, he, he say one thing and do another, put his foot in it all the time. You know, 
Prayer was a kind of fire. This is the guy that got revelation from the Holy Spirit, who Jesus was. You know, all the disciples were sitting around, and Jesus said to them, "Well, who, who's people saying I am?" And a few of them, "Oh, I don't know. Well, it could be this." Gonna... And then Peter gets revelation from the Holy Spirit and says, well, "You're the Christ. You're the Messiah." So he gets revelation from the Holy Spirit one minute, praised by Jesus because Jesus praised him up for that. And then the next minute he gets rebuked by Jesus and called Satan because he tries to stop Jesus from carrying out his ministry. This is the guy that got out of the boat. You know, all the disciples were in the boat. It was only Peter who put his hand up and said, I'm going to step out of the boat and walk on water if you tell me to, God. And he stepped out of the boat and walked on water. But then he sunk. This is the guy who stood up for Jesus and said, I'll die for you, Jesus. I'll stand with you and I will die with you. But Nan would betray him and deny that he even knew him. But this is the guy at Pentecost who planted some seed and 3,000 lives got added to the church. And this guy would go on to be the head of the New Testament church. According to legend, it took Thomas Edison 1,000 tries to invent the light bulb. In other words, he failed 999 times before he reached success. Soon after Edison revealed his earth-shattering invention, a French reporter asked him, Mr. Edison, how did it feel to fail 999 times? Thomas Edison just smiled and replied, Young man, I have not failed 999 times. I simply found 999 ways how not to create a light bulb. In other words, Thomas Edison learned from his mistakes. He refused to be discouraged by those 999 botched experiments. Most people would have given up much sooner. But yet each failure taught Edison something important. It allowed him to go back and tweak the process or switch out the components until he finally got it right. So fear will often make us keep the seed in our hand. Another reason why we hang on to our seed is, is doubt. You think, well maybe I'm not a gardener so I can't possibly grow anything. It's not us that causes the growth. It's God. So all we have to do is plant. He's got to do the rest. In 1 Corinthians 3 verse 6 it says, I planted, this is Paul speaking, it says, I planted, Paul watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. So God's telling us to plant then it's not our responsibility what happens after we plant. It's God's responsibility to make it grow. You know, God says, hey, I want you to go you know, speak to the person or, or pray for that person. You know, all we'll do is be obedient and do it. And it's God's responsibility what happens out of that. And sometimes we're going we're gonna to plant, so you know, we're going to go share the gospel with somebody and nothing's going to happen. But it's not our responsibility to make it happen. That's God. Maybe you think, I, didn't, I don't need to sow, as I did it a long time ago, it's for, time for somebody else. And I've, I've seen churches who, who had, had great success as a church, and then they died because everybody in that church said, well, I did it a few years ago and now it's somebody else's turn to, to share the gospel or plant the seed. And nobody has and the church has died. Or maybe you think, I don't need to sow, I'm just a reaper. There will be some times where you, when you'll reap the results from somebody else's sowing, but there will be times when somebody will reap from your sowing. What we need to be <coughs> willing is to both sow, water and reap as God asks. So I've had it in the past where I've shared with somebody, I've shared the gospel with somebody and it's like I'm speaking to a brick wall and nothing has happened. 
and then somebody else has come along and said exactly the same thing as me, and this person's gone, wow, I've never seen that before. And I stand there thinking, what did I just finish saying? You know? But that's life. Sometimes people are going to sow, and some people are going to reap. You know? And if God's telling you to sow to a certain person, well, you're the person for it. But we allow doubt to come in. So, see, too often we, we allow doubt to come in, we get caught up in running different scenarios for our mind. You know, we think, well, if, if I said this to this person, they might react this way. If I, and we run all these scenarios for our mind instead of saying, okay, God, I'm just going to do what you tell me to do. And sometimes it might not seem logical, you know. You know, God says, go over to that person over there and, and just take an A. And that's all you have to do. It. You know, you don't have to bash them over there with the gospel, build a relationship and say good day. You know, we run too many scenarios for our own mind instead of saying, I'm just going to be obedient, God, and do. Another reason why we hold on to the is we, come, we get complacent. We get too comfortable in ourselves. Materially and spiritually, we become too comfortable. We become, become too routine. Let me do it my own. Let me do my own thing, God. I won't bother you. You don't bother me. We don't want to have revival in this church because somebody might sit in my seat. Somebody might talk to my friends. You know? And, and we get complacent. We say, oh, I'm, I'm happy with the way the things are. You know, I don't want it, don't want it to grow. In the book of Revelations, Jesus is talking to the various churches. And there's a church there, the lukewarm church, where he says to them, I wish that you would be hot or cold, but you're lukewarm, because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. He's speaking to the church of lesser days, they were comfortable in themselves. They were a rich, powerful city. They had material things. They had aqueducts to bring cool water into the city. And it was famous for its hot spas used for healing. So to them, they had it made. They were comfortable in their life and they didn't really do anything. And Jesus challenged them and said, you're too complacent. You know, it'd be better if you're hot or cold, but you're lukewarm, so I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. We get too complacent. Billy Graham, probably the most world famous evangelist in the world and it's, uh, said in an interview and it always stuck in my mind when I saw this interview he said that he's so nervous his stomach is doing somersaults and his palms are all sweaty before he arrives at the venue to speak because he's wondering if anybody will turn up to hear him speak but he said it was good. It stops him from being complacent and he comforts himself in the knowledge that it's God's problem if no one turns up, he's just doing what God told him to do. <coughs> this is a guy that's spoken to hundreds and millions of people. Sometimes we need to get out of our comfort zone and allow God distract us so that we cannot rely on ourselves. We have to rely on God. Getting out of comfort zone means stepping out of the boat sometimes and that causes us to use our faith. Another reason why we're hanging on to our seat is we've got the wrong focus. Often we look at our, our limitations and see barriers instead of saying what we, what do you want me to do God? You know, we, we see limitations on the type of seed that we've got. The size of the garden. And we think, well, if I had more money, I'd be able to buy better seed. If I had more money and a bigger garden, I could plant better crops. I'd be able to buy better fertiliser. So we focus on what we can't do instead of focusing on what we can do. And the enemy will get into your mind, you know. And you say, well... You're not experienced enough. You haven't been to Bible school. 
you're not not a strong Christian so don't say anything because people don't really want to hear what you've got to say keep it to yourself and you hang on to the seed instead but God says you know you don't do it in your own strength you don't do it in your own knowledge you do it in my knowledge you know, it's not you speaking, it's me speaking it's my Holy Spirit flowing for you We focus on what we can't do instead of focusing on what we can do. We focus on what we don't have instead of focusing on what we do have. We may not be a great evangelist or, or a great talker like Billy Graham, but what we can do is we can walk across the room and just speak to somebody, say hello. Our focus should always be on God. What do you want, God? We have to learn to trust God and have faith and work and so on his timeline there's nothing wrong with the seed it's good seed and so I 55 11 it says my word be that goes forth from my mouth it shall not return to me void but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the things which I have sent it we need to trust the seed trust God and step out in faith and so if we never failed we wouldn't need faith you know, if you're guaranteed and every time you sowed seed, it would do a huge harvest. Every time you prayed for somebody, they got instantly healed, you wouldn't need faith. Because it comes so easy. But see, often we get disheartened. We plan it and we don't see results. But see, we've got to learn to, to trust God and operate by his timeline. You know? you know, you share the gospel with somebody and they're a brick wall. And you think, well, that was a waste of time. But it's not. Because the seed's been planted. And you don't know what's going to happen. You know, they could go home and lay in bed and then the Holy Spirit starts working on them. And you've got something to work with and, and there's and maybe just something, a verse that you've maybe shared with them or, or something you said to them and it just keeps on joining them and they may not, not even be aware it's working in them and then somebody else comes along and might share something and same thing, it's like a brick wall and, but it, it's chipping away and it's allowing God to work and do something in them and then eventually somebody comes along and says it's exactly the same thing as the first two people said and bang, you know, something inside clicks and they take, take it in and they respond it may take a day, it may take a week it may take years you know, I've heard of people who who are growing adults and they're in their 40s and 50s or something and they've shared testimonies that they got saved because something that they heard in Sunday school when they were a little kid popped into their mind so many years later out of the blue this verse that they learnt and, and it may be just a simple little song they learnt in Sunday school suddenly it starts playing in their mind they can't get out of their mind and the Holy Spirit is stirring things up and they respond but see we get too impatient with our sowing we want instant results but I'm not a great gardener but I know if you want quick results plant radishes because they come up pretty quick and you plant a whole heap of them and I like radishes so. but other things you plant and they take a long time to come up and you can plant them and you can stand there and think well nothing's happening, nothing's happening we don't know what's happening underground it's the same with in the spiritual when we plant seed we don't know what's happening inside somebody Sometimes God will tell you the plant when it does not seem logical to you. And it may be something simple like walk across the room. You might say, okay, I want you to go talk to that person over there. And you think, well, would I be better off if I talk to that person over there and get Neil to talk to that person over there because Neil's more suited? No, God told you to go talk to that person over there for a reason.
and we have to be prepare the ground or we are sown willy nilly. You know, in, in the parable, Jesus talks about the seed, you know, getting thrown and and some of it landing on the gravel and, and, and nothing happens and some lands lands on the on the um among the weeds and gets strangled up, but some lands on the good soil and gives a harvest. We need to prepare the ground. We need to listen to the Holy Spirit. Otherwise we risk sowing at the wrong time or in the wrong place. See sometimes you might think, well, I might go and share the gospel with that person over there. And God says to you, no. And you think, well, that can't be God because God wouldn't stop me from sharing the gospel. But we've got to be obedient so that's God's timeline. You know, there may be a reason for him not to tell you. We need to be in tune with the Holy Spirit. So we're not sowing at the wrong time or in the wrong place. You know, Ecclesiastes 3 1 says, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. So everybody is different and everyone can react differently to the seed that you plant. Some people, you've got to spend more time preparing the ground. You know, it means you, you can't just go in and bang, hit them over the head with the gospel because it's just going to overwhelm them and, and they're just going to say, well, no. Nah. You know, you've got to build a relationship. You've got to love them. And, and, and maybe demonstrate the gospel in action before you actually challenge them. Some you have to water more. That's all you may ever do. You may be just watering. And maybe down the track that someone else comes along and sows what you've, you've been watering or prepare the ground. As I said, one plant, one waters, one reaps. But what we need to do is be obedient to the Holy Spirit. You know, like, like I have today. I believe God laid this on my heart. I can sow the seed by sharing the message. Sometimes I see results. Sometimes I won't. Sometimes people say, well, that's the worst message you ever preach. I'm like, oh, it may have been, but I'm just doing what God told me to do. Some people might respond to it. But we just need to be obedient, you know, on how we sow the seed, where we sow the seed, and when we sow the seed. We need to listen to God because God is the ultimate gardener. You know, he knows what he's doing. And sometimes we, we just can't comprehend why he would ask me to sow the seed or do this or do that. But all we've got to do is step out in faith, trust him, 